Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our program today. And welcome back to Barnard College. My name is Free Mondesir, and I am from the class of 2003. I am a member of the reunion committee, and I have been coming back to Barnard for many reasons since I've graduated. One of the reasons is I love to attend the lectures and seminars. And then of course, I know it sounds cliche, but it's really true. I love connecting with students and alums from across the generations because we have so much in common from our life experiences and attending Barnard. So I want to inform you that this event will be recorded and as attendees, you will not have microphone or camera access during this event and your voices, likeness, and our images will not be captured by Barnard College. However, written submission of questions may be shared during the Q&A portion of the event. Before we begin today's program, to everyone who is watching or taking part in the tumult occurring in streets across the US and around the world, please know that we in the alumni and wider Barnard community stand against all anti-Black violence and rhetoric. Even in times of crisis, reunion is a space for Barnard alumni from every corner of the globe to connect and to learn from each other. And we feel it is important to continue providing these opportunities. With that, welcome to a webinar that addresses a highly relevant topic in today's world at any life stage financial planning during times of crisis. We are honored to have two experts with us today, Galia Gishan and Sinia El Amin, class of 2016. Galia is an independent personal financial expert with more than 20 years in financial services, including nearly 10 years on Wall Street and an MBA in finance from Fordham University. Her career has been corporate bond research as an analyst, a personal finance expert, an angel investor, entrepreneur advisor, and author. She is the founder of Down to Earth Finance, an independent personal finance education organization, and she has been teaching at Barnard College's Athena Center for Leadership for more than 10 years, as well as at Sacred Heart University. Galia has been widely quoted in the New York Times, NBC, CNN, Real Simple, and more. Previously, she worked at Bear Stearns and Nomura Securities. She is the author of My Money Matters, which was featured on the Today Show. Sinia graduated from Barna in 2016. She is on a mission to transform her finances and pay off $23,000 in debt this year. She has created a blog, flynanced.com. Cynthia, I can't wait to hear about how many viewers you have. And here she details her personal journey to become debt free. Flynanced.com grew out of Cynthia's desire to show others how travel could be affordable. As an avid traveler to more than 27 countries, she is committed to encouraging others to see the world on their own terms. For the past three years, Sinia has worked in product management and product development at American Express and MasterCard. She is the incoming chair of the Alumni Association of Barna Colleges Young Alumni Committee and serves as board treasurer for the Columbia, Columbia Black Alumni Council. After graduating from Barnard in 2016, Sinia earned a Master of Science degree in management from Wake Forest University School of Business. We will hear first from Sinia, then Galia, followed by a conversation between them, and there will be questions at the end. It is now my pleasure to introduce Sinia El Ami. Thank you. Hi, fellow alumni. It's so good to be in conversation with all of you today. And even though this has been a really difficult week uh, for us as, as a community and as a country, I'm, I'm still really excited to share uh, the afternoon with you all.
I forgot to share my screen before I presented, so apologies about that. So thank you again, Free, for that really awesome introduction. Um, I just want to take a few minutes to just share a little bit about how I fell into this work after graduating from Barnard. Um, as you heard, my background is in financial services and in business management. And I really see the work that I'm doing with finance as an opportunity for me to bring together my personal passions for travel, as well as my professional background. So I'm really excited also in this moment as we think about what our new futures will look like to use finance as a way to springboard more conversations around wealth building and living financially free. Um, as Free mentioned, I am on track to pay off $23,000 in debt this year. So if you are someone who is also eager about becoming debt free, I encourage you to follow my journey on Flynance, where I show the steps that I'm taking to live a debt free lifestyle. So over the next few minutes, I'm just going to share three main tips for handling your personal finances during moments of crisis. Throughout, I will also share items that are actionable by anyone. And these are also tips that I have used this year as we have navigated through COVID and beyond. So the first tip that I wanna leave you all with is it's important to organize your money. In moments of crisis, it is critical to understand your financial picture. It's the only way that you know whether or not you're in need or whether you're in surplus. And these are great ways for you to understand how to be impactful and how to move forward during these difficult moments. One way that I organize my money is by separating my money into different accounts based on their purpose. And this is what I've illustrated here in my money map. This is a visual representation of where all of my money goes. And it really allows me to quickly see where my focus areas are and really allows me to ask myself, are these areas of my finances aligning with my values and with my goals? So here's your first action item. I want you to think about the ways that you organize your money and ask yourself, are you finding clarity in your system? And if not, what are ways that you can better create clarity organization in the way that you're handling your finances? One of the first ways that I organized my money was actually by separating my bills from my everyday spend. This is critical in moments of crisis because it allows you to understand what money you might have at your discretion to be able to uh, support your community, to buy emergency supplies, and also support loved ones. Uh, by separating these monies into separate accounts, it also gave me clarity to be able to know how much money I could put towards my debt repayment plan, um, as well as what money I could use to treat myself and do other things. I've also separated my savings goals into different accounts based on their purpose. So no brainer, because I am the creator of finance, I save consistently for travel. I'm also saving consistently for emergency funds, for health savings, as well as for miscellaneous funds that may come up like gifts and holidays. And we'll also learn in this presentation more about investing. And I've also done the work of separating my investment accounts into different areas that allows me to really focus on the time horizon and how aggressive I want to be in those different accounts. So in summary, to organize your money, you want to first create a system, as I mentioned, create a system for your expenses and your savings and your everyday expenses. I recommend that you separate your money into purposeful accounts that allows you to really put intention behind your money and where your dollars are going. And automate where possible. I am a big believer in using direct deposits as a way to pay myself first. So I consistently take a portion of every paycheck and put it into the different areas that I showed in the previous slide. This allows me to take the financial worry out of thinking about, am I saving enough? Am I saving consistently? So if these tips are helpful for you, I definitely encourage you to use them as a way to better organize your money in moments of crisis. Now moving on to my next tip. I want you to also think about prioritizing savings. One of the best things you can do in a moment of crisis is maintain a comfortable amount of cash or liquid assets. 
And access to cash, as we've seen from the COVID-19 outbreak, um, can be a critical way to ensure that, you're, that you have financial peace of mind. Uh, having access to cash allows you to gather emergency supplies. It allows you the uh, freedom to be able to quickly mobilize and move if you need to in moments of distress. And it also allows you to support causes and, and broaden your social network in ways that you might not be able to if you don't have uh, excess cash available. So how to get started. The first way to think about prioritizing savings is to first determine what's your why? Like, why are you saving? And I think this is so critical because I think there's a lot of information that can circulate in the personal finance world uh, that kind of gives cookie cutter advice. And I truly believe that we all have our individual personal finance journeys that we're on. And it's important for you to think about your financial picture and what is important for you and where you wanna make impact. So for me, I save for future travels because I'm excited to travel when it's gonna be safe for us to do so. And I'm also personally saving for six months of expenses and emergency fund. But your, my, your why might be different. You might be thinking about moving into a new home putting a down payment on a home or an investment property, thinking about saving excess cash to invest in the markets or in other um, emerging markets, or maybe you're also supporting your family. So it's so important for you to also take a moment as you're thinking about prioritizing savings to determine your personal why. So once you know why you're saving, I want you to make sure that you're using the right vehicle to prioritize and accelerate your savings. So here's your next action item. I want you, if you haven't already, to open a high yield savings account. Why? Well, in moments of crisis, we want our cash working as hard as it possibly can for us, especially in times where our mobility, uh, whether that's with our career or even just physically, if we're sheltering in place, might be limited. A high yield savings account is a savings account that offers an annual percentage yield, or APY, of at least 1.25%. And this really means, this is really just a fancy way of saying, this is how much interest you're gonna earn over the course of a year by having your money in this specific account. And I think high yield savings accounts are great ways to accelerate your savings without even thinking about it. As I've illustrated in this example here, here we have two individuals who are saving pretty much about the same amount. They've also started with the same amount that they are depositing into their savings account. But one decides to save her money in a high yield savings account. And at the end of the year, she's made almost $50 in interest, whereas the other individual has only made 46 cents. So I think as we think about saving and prioritizing savings, let's also make sure that we are being uh, intentional and, and really being strategic with where we are putting this money um, for our benefit and for our community's benefit. I also want you to think about ways that you might be able to get creative with saving, um, even in times where uh, your income may be stretched or, or may be really limited. I also want you to take this next action item with you. If you take nothing else from this presentation, I hope you take this. I want you to think about negotiating your monthly obligations with your providers to save money. So if you look at this graphic, which is this incredible negotiating bingo graphic that I um, borrowed from launchnegotiation.com. If, uh, if you look at this graphic, ask yourself, do you see anything on this graphic that you didn't know was negotiable? I think we should absolutely, as women, as fellow alumni, we should absolutely be leveraging our good standing as consumers and as customers in moments of crisis to revisit these agreements with our providers. And we should also be challenging ourselves not to see these monthly obligations as fixed. You know, in moments of crisis, uh, these providers are really looking to keep us as customers. So we should do our job to make sure that we are um, intentionally asking for and, um, and, and really using the surplus that we might be able to save from these monthly obligations to accelerate our savings goals. So in summary, I want you to prioritize savings by first thinking about your why. Why are you saving? What is important for you? And where do you want to put the most impact behind your dollars? I want you to open a high yield savings account. There are several different options in the market and I definitely encourage you to uh, take some time to research different options. And always remember a high yield savings account offers an annual percentage yield of at least 1.25%. And if you're struggling with this, I'm always happy to help and offer resources if I can. I also want you to negotiate your expenses and save the surplus. 
So call up your cell phone provider, call up your utility company and really negotiate with them and, and use your good standing to take the surplus that you'd otherwise be spending and put it towards uh, you know, savings that can help you in the long run. And also, if you wanna take it a step further, think about transferring money into savings that you'd otherwise be spending. I know for me, I have been sheltering in place for the last few months. So I've been really intentional about using the money I'd otherwise be using to commute or as part of my daily work uh, routine to put towards savings to really help me accelerate as quickly as I can. And finally, I wanna leave you with this tip. Let's always remember that personal finance is deeply personal. It is political and it is really rooted in our individual perspectives. So I really hope that you take the information that Galia and I share with you today to really make your own informed decisions about your money. I want you to think about finding a plan that works best for you. I want you to think about staying current and on your bills and debt payments, especially if you can. And don't forget to ask for help if you need it. As I mentioned, many of the providers today are also dealing with the crisis that we are currently in. So don't be afraid to ask for help if you need it. And if you're really struggling with your financial obligations to uh, see what hardship programs or other opportunities your providers might have to help you in this moment of crisis. And also don't forget to lean into digital communities for support. I am consistently blown away by the, the love, support, and accountability that I found in digital communities through my platform with Flynance. And you know, you, seeing other women in the hashtag debt-free community, for example, was really a way that prompted me to think about becoming debt-free for myself. So if you're also looking for those opportunities, don't think that sheltering in place has to stop us from building community and continue to have these conversations as women, as women of color, and as future wealth builders. And just before I close, I just want to take a moment to, to really remind us that taking control of our finances, building wealth for the next generation, getting informed about the economy and what's going on with our money are all ways that we can enact social change. And one way that I've been really working towards supporting the work uh, in defense of Black lives is supporting organizations that are led by Black queer people, Black women. Um, and I am asking you, if you're able, to please join me in this fight. Uh, you know, today we honor the lives of Nina Pop, Tony McDade, and many other Black trans people who were killed by violence. Um, so I ask you if you're able to please think about supporting these organizations that I've listed here on the screen um, or others that you might find in your research. For example, Fair Flight led by Stacey Abrams, which is leading to fair and accessible elections as we think about today being Super Tuesday in, in many states across the country. Black Visions Collective is a justice collective led by Black, queer, and trans people in Minnesota and they've been doing the work since 2017. The Loveland Foundation is doing work to provide mental health resources for black women and girls in communities of color. And For the Girls is a grassroots black trans led organization that is raising funds to, pro to provide rent assistance and more for black trans people. So I, I hope that this presentation of it quit has been helpful. Um, and I'm so excited to be on this journey with you all uh, as we think about building wealth and, and creating the futures that we want even in moments of crisis. So thank you so much. Hi, um, can everybody hear me? Yes, okay. Um, let me start by sharing my screen. Okay. Um, Thank you, Sunia. That is a hard act to follow, I'm not gonna lie. Um, so thank you for having me. I am not a Barnard alum. I think I'm the only person on this call who's not. I have been um, teaching though at the Barnard, uh, first the Financial Fluency, and then the Athena Center for Leadership for actually 13 years now. So, um, and I'm, I, as, as a mother of two daughters, I feel like it's, it's where I want them to go to college. I'm very inspired by um, the Barnard women that I've just met over the last 13 years um, and teaching there and just meeting alumni. So thank you for having me today. Um, and just start by sharing that this is just an unprecedented time of what we've seen in the last week and just wanna be really sensitive to everything. Um, 
is today I'm going to be really focusing just on investment and retirement planning. And um, personally, I am an impact investor as an angel investor that I only support um, women-led companies um, and I only and uh, or companies that are impact. And so I've actually been part of recently just um, pitch events for angel investors for founders of color and um, other impact angel investments. Um, so that's something that I'm personally, and I am sh gonna share some just retail investments that will, that support just uh, because I, I feel that one way that we can support these movements is through our dollars. Um, sometimes there's no better way to, to do that. So thank you. And I've got a lot of information here, but you'll get this presentation afterwards. It'll be available to you. Um, just my quick bio, spent 10 years on Wall Street, and then I realized that I wanted to teach people about investing and retirement planning independently. I don't sell any investments. I don't manage money. I teach lots of courses all through New York City, all around the country, online. I've um, been doing it for a long time, and I wrote a book, and um, so it's just, it's, it's my path. Um, Investment in knowledge pays the best interest. It doesn't matter where you are. I work with a lot of artists, freelancers, um, graphic designers, creative people, and just it's, I see success everywhere. Um, this is Peter Lynch. He's the one of the founders of um, the the first mainstay of mutual funds um, at Fidelity. So know what know what you own. Open your closet. Um, what we are doing today is creating healthy money habits. That is the most important thing. And listen to this presentation, look it over, over and over. Um, so I just wanna talk for just five minutes because I know that there are um, a lot of people that are potentially unemployed that might not have resources available to them from an income standpoint. So just first of all, here's two slides that are gonna be in the presentation of grants that I found for people that are self-employed, that are artists, that are just really dealing with without income at all, especially for the younger graduates. So this is available to you. Um, and then also just from a rent, a debt, um, student loan perspective, there are things you can do to really get yourself help there. So you're, um, if you really have no income, so just again, and I'm just going over it rather quickly because I know in the interest of time, but want to share that this is available to you and you know feel free to email me if you've got more questions um, and I do a lot of seminars with the freelancers union in Brooklyn so these are people who are freelance who dried up and I work with theaters so that's something that I put together for them um, and again unemployment it's been a bear but if you can apply for it even as a freelancer it actually gives you a little bit more money um, and then just quickly, I know Sunia had done just a fantastic job of organization. I will say that this is just a quick, quick exercise that I've done for people that are truly without income is really looking at three month cash flow. Like things are changing so rapidly. And if we can just look at things on a quickly three month basis, it's really, really helpful to say, what cash do I have? What's coming in? What am I paying? So I can really see where I am, May, June, July. I know today we're at June. So if I just update this, where am I at the end of August? And you get an idea, do I need to borrow money or how much from savings. Okay, so today, really talking about saving versus investing, investment terms, retirement forecast, which retirement plan is best for you and where to buy investments. And I know I've got about 15 minutes to do this. <laughs> um, so the first thing you wanna answer is when do I need the money? And for most of us, it's long-term, it's retirement. And so that's 10 years or longer. Short term is cash. And Sunni had talked about some of the places, you know, some of my favorite places to invest cash are these high yield savings accounts, such as Capital One 360 or American Express Savings. But on a longer term basis, I really focus on the large mutual fund companies, such as Vanguard, Fidelity, Schwab. These are, and again, I don't work for them. I don't get paid for them for many of these places. But again, you need to think about when do you want your money? And if you really want your money in less than three years, I would stay out of the market. And then what is your risk level? And most of us are moderate, but I would really just look at moderate and conservative and just make decisions based on that. Um, especially when you're looking at long-term and retirement money, like saving versus investing is that saving is just not gonna get you very far. And really is at least if you have at least three to five years or longer, you really have the time frame to really um, do more. And it can really be the difference between retiring and non-retiring. Um, I can't stress this enough that everyone can learn about investing. And again, this is a presentation and I teach this class at Barnard, it's the investing class. And I would say that 
you know, listen to it over and over. So what I'm going to focus on today is mutual funds, which is how most of us do our investing. Um, and it lets us be diversified. It lets us have transparency. It lets us invest in a group of stocks or a group of bonds. Um, it lets us get in at very, very low fees and also low dollar amounts, especially if you have zero saved or very little saved, you can get in. Um, you know, really the biggest criticism with mutual funds is their fees, but I'm actually really, really budgety and really cheap when it comes to mutual funds. And I focus on index funds or places like Vanguard or Fidelity or Schwab. Um, so just to start about where you can buy investments, I'll come back to that slide. So these are just kind of to break it down, some of my favorite places. Um, the first is like a do-it-yourself mutual fund company and Vanguard being the biggest there. You can start with $1,000 just to open a mutual fund, their star fund or their um, target date fund. Um, the second is the supermarkets, so just Fidelity or Schwab. And usually their minimum is 2,500, but they actually have more options that are zero. And what I like about them is that when quarantine is lifted and COVID pairs down a little bit is they do have brick and mortar offices that you can actually see someone or talk to somebody, um, but their customer service is excellent. So I've been at Fidelity for 20 plus years. And they're working with a brokerage firm or money manager and just understanding the fees that you would pay, whether it's total assets under management or load funds, um, and really saying, you know, the service that am I going to get? And again, a lot of the questions that I'm going to have you ask today, you should still work with that person. Um, and then this has become very popular, these investment apps. And I'd say the two most popular are Betterment and Wealthfront. Um, and those are great for, you know, their total fees are only 0.25%. And you can open IRAs there, and they invest in index funds and ETFs. And in fact, if you have some spare time, NPR um, has a great podcast, How I Built This, and they interview the founder of Betterment, and it's a really great podcast. Um, and I love Acorns as an app just to round up your savings, and then you can invest it. And I, believe it or not, I heard it from a Barnard student about it the first time. And Robin Hood, I actually heard from a, a teacher at a high school in Brooklyn. I heard that from one of the high school students there. So. Those are my three favorite right now about where you can really buy investments. And I would say if you're um, a little bit older and you have old 401ks from old jobs, or if you've got um, IRAs you've opened at different firms, you know, one of your goals might be is to really consolidate your investments and your statements to either Vanguard or a supermarket or at least one or two places so you can really um, be able to, you know, make sure that you're diversified and that you're not overpaying or that you're not having too many of one investment. Um, I'm gonna go back through this mutual fund checklist, but I have to say I've worked with clients for 15, 20 years and they keep coming back to the checklist. So this is a great thing to think about if you have investments and you really wanna see how they're performing. So I'm just gonna quickly go over two mutual funds here. And these are my two favorites. So the first is the S&P 500. Um, so I'm just making my Zoom screen a little bit smaller so I can see this. So what I've done is I've circled the key areas on the checklist. So this is the S&P 500 index fund from Vanguard, but you can find it at Fidelity, at Schwab, pretty much every large mutual fund company has it. Um, the first is it's rated five star, excuse me, this is rated four stars out of five. So that is a risk rating that you wanna look at. Every mutual fund has it, and if you um, have a mutual fund that doesn't have it, it's not a good idea. To own it. Um, this is a large blend, so it's made up of large stocks. You can see Microsoft, Apple. This is the fee. It's either an expense ratio, which is an annual fee, or the load, which is an upfront fee that some financial advisors will charge. Um, the, the average expense ratio for mutual funds is about one and a half percent, and most people are just are not even aware that they're um, spending that. So it's a good question to ask. And then finally, the returns. So these are annualized numbers. That means if I held this fund for the last three years, I earned 9.93%. So again, the, the checklist here is everything that I've circled is on this checklist. Um, if you're just getting started on investing and you're looking for a mutual fund for your IRA, or maybe your 401k offers this. So these are what's called target retirement date funds. And again, I'm just showing you an example from a Vanguard one, but every company offers it. So this is a mutual fund that has essentially all the investments you will need for your retirement account. So it'll have a large cap, a small cap, international bond, which are really the four main categories plus more. So again, the categories, it's four stars, it costs 0.14%, it's target date, 
So as you can see here, this mutual fund has about 24% in bonds, some international, and some large cap and small cap. And then again, the returns on a return basis. And then I've actually done this here as well. I'm showing you four or five different mutual funds from Vanguard. And again, I don't work for Vanguard. I don't suggest you buy them, but I just really wanted to show you examples. So these are great mutual funds for a longer term portfolio. So there's a large cap here, a small cap made up of small companies, an international, and then a bond fund. And then this is what's also called a balanced fund, the Vanguard Wellesley. So this is a mutual fund that has stocks and bonds in it. So just to really summarize that if you're just starting out, you can start with a balanced fund or a target date fund, or, and I'll talk about this for in a minute, but if you're really interested in what's called socially responsible investing, so investing along categories such as gender equality or climate change or racial equality, there's ETFs, which is essentially like of a type of mutual fund. So here's a list of them. Um, and then I've also just given you an example of three mutual funds. And there's a lot more work here, and I've actually just started looking at this given everything that's going on. These are three mutual funds that are either owned or led by people of color or really focused. Cornerstone Capital is, a, is, is run by a woman here in New York City, Impact Share. So these are just three examples of ways that we can vote with our dollars and vote. Let's definitely get out and vote, speaking of. Um, last, before I get into retirement plans, because I know I've got about five more minutes, is if you look at really this, this second part of the categories, once you've determined, am I going to be at Vanguard or Fidelity at Schwab, or if I just really looking at all of your especially longer term investments in one place, you want to see how they're divided up. And so I've just given you a sample here. A very, very rough rule of thumb is called your age in bonds. So I know that I'm you know, I'm, I'm the mother of teenagers, so I'm nearly 50 years old. So I have about 40% in bonds in my total portfolio, and then large cap, small cap, and international, I break it out like that. Obviously, being in your younger, if you're in your 20s, you have about 20% or 15 to 20% in bonds. So everybody needs some bonds in their longer term portfolio. But again, it's just depending on your age, your time frame, and your risk. If you're looking on a shorter term basis, you might want to just adjust to money markets or short term bonds. Um, and again, these high yield savings accounts that Nia talked about are fantastic. Um, I'm personally at, I just actually opened another one at Marcus, which is the Goldman Sachs one. It's paying about 1.3%. Um, and then midterm, so maybe you're saving for grad school. Like again, if you have five to 10 years for me, I'm saving for my kid's college or um, or maybe you're saving for a down payment. And there's lots of the whys that Sunia talked about it. But if you have a little more time, you can look at a balanced fund. Um, and I know this is a lot of information. So lastly, just before we finish up, is really making sure that you have the right retirement plan for you. Um, so it's easiest if you work for a company, and that's going to be a 401k if you work for a for-profit company. But if you work for a nonprofit, it would be a 403b. And so if that's your situation, that's where really you should focus on um, doing most of your or all of your retirement savings. So that's 19,000 a year on a pre-tax basis with the catch up. Um, and I jump now to S um, a SEP IRA. If you work for yourself, consider opening up a SEP because you can really put a lot of money away working for yourself and contributing it on a pre-tax basis as well. And then the Roth is a gray area. We can all do the Roth depending really just on our income. So anyone can open and contribute a Roth and you would do it at a place like a Vanguard or Betterment or Fidelity or Schwab. Um, and you can only do it if you earn less than 135 as a single person or 199,000 as married. And so the amount is you can only put up to 6,000 there. By the way, just a little tip, if you haven't, if you can do the Roth and you haven't done it for 2019, you actually have until July 15th to add to your Roth. Um, and then for 2020, obviously, you have all year. And if you're over 50, they have catch-up provisions. So if you're over 50, you can add 1,000, so that's 7,000 total, or 6,000 to your 401k or 403b. These are catch-ups for people that are over 50. So what I want you to, again, to walk away with is what retirement plan are you doing? What is your number? And make that a priority. And especially, I don't know if there's men on the call, but especially, especially for women to have an account that's in their name, a retirement account, and that they are making it a priority to contribute to. 
Um, here's just the tax benefits. Once you open the account, if you don't pick the investments, it will not grow. The IRA, whether it's the SEP, the Roth, or the 401k, is a big empty account that essentially has tax benefits. Um, the Roth, the benefit of the Roth is it comes out tax free after age 59 and a half, but the 401k and SEP lets you put more money away. So there's no easy answer there. And I'm happy to answer questions afterwards, which one. Um, I'm going to jump to the 45 age. So this is a fantastic calculator that I love, and I know I'm going to probably have to wrap up here. This is, by the way, and I've given you the, the website, but you can also Google calculators, um, fidelity retirement score. So this is just a fantastic tool. It's five questions. You don't have to be a fidelity member, but it's my favorite calculator, and it uses statistical analysis. I know I've built spreadsheets based on this, and I still find this calculator. So you would put here how old you are, and it asks these questions, how much you would like to live on, and it takes inflation into account. So just really put your salary today, and how much you've saved for retirement, whether it's zero, 200,000, 10 million, um, and then how much you're currently saving. And then it basically, so according to this, this is a 45-year-old person that would like to live on 150,000 in retirement, and she saved $200,000. So this is saying that if she does this and she's only saving 15,000 a year, she's gonna have half of what she needs in retirement. Most of us are not saving enough for retirement. It's very common. So what can you do? Number one, she can save more if she can. She can retire later, which I would say most of us cannot completely retire at 65. She can live on less. Like I know my mom is in her 70s. She's still working part-time. Like many of us aren't necessarily. I hope to work until you know, I keep going. Um, so there's lots of things to do, but this is just a retirement checkup. And I actually did it for a person who's 25 um, years old. So you can see this person is saving 100% of what they need. I think I'm getting the warning sign that I have to wrap up. Okay. Um, just lastly, simplify your financial life. So where are your retirement plans? Consolidate IRAs. Pick one place for all your accounts. Roll over old 401ks. Um, some big no's, affirmations. And so here's just to summarize, is get to know your mutual funds. Look at the checklist. Consolidate plans and old IRAs to one place. Make a decision if you should keep or sell. And again, if you can plug that information from the mutual fund checklist into either Morningstar, just be able to answer those questions. Rebalance your portfolio. Make sure you stay diversified. Do a checkup once a year. It's like going to the doctor. Um, am I on track with annual savings? And just right away, take one action step. So maybe it's just, what is my retirement plan? Let me do the retirement calculator. Let me look at some investments. Um, and then lastly, this was actually my book that I wrote. It was on the Today Show. Is I'm, I'm a finance person. I have degrees in finance and accounting. I've worked on Wall Street. But at the end of the day, it's so much of money is just how we think about it. And so I'm a big fan of affirmations. Um, surround yourself with positive money people, like the how many people are on this call? 80, 100 people on this call. I'm an active participant in my finances. I'm ready to change my money habits and take responsibility for my financial actions. And lastly, by respecting my finances, I enrich all my relationships. So I know I talked fast. I gave you a lot of information, and I'm happy to stay on for as long as you need to to um, answer questions. Thank you very much. That was great, Galia. I'm, I'm definitely going to use the Fidelity uh, Retirement Calculator. I've, I've never seen that tool. It's so powerful. And they also have a, um, a calculator if you're saving for college. So if you have children that are saving for college, they have a really, it's so user friendly. Like I know it's like a, I'm, I'm a total spreadsheet geek and I've built spreadsheets. And so I always compare my spreadsheets and now I don't even use my spreadsheets anymore. I just use that calculator and I use the, um, the college savings because it says, you know, you can put in how old your child is, how much you're saving. And, and again, they use statistical analysis. So I'm really proud of that tool or that calculator for, for my clients. And again, you don't have to be a Fidelity client. Anybody can do it. So it's a really I'm gonna check that out after this. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I know there are a ton of questions. Um, yeah. Maybe we should start at the top. Um, and Golly, I know you mentioned some specific companies and, and that's one of the questions here. Um, what are some specific high yield savings account options for folks. I know you mentioned yeah, so 
Capital One 360, um, there's Marcus, which is Goldman Sachs, there's Ally, LLY, which is based on the auto companies, um, and then there's American Express Savings. Um, yep. You know, the key to know that these are all FDIC insured. Um, so yes, they are. Um, and it's, okay. you know, so which means that, and there's no fees, no minimum. So I actually, I'm, I bank at Chase. My sister banks at a credit union in Colorado, but all of our savings or accounts are Marcus or Capital One 360. And you know what I, when something you said, Sunia, that I thought was really powerful is the money's a little bit harder to get to. Like I'm, a, I also have separate savings accounts. And yeah. so there is something to be said for like, you know what, like I'm at the ATM, I can't get it or it's gonna take a day or two for the money to transfer from this online account back to my bank. Maybe I don't need it then. So out of sight, out of mind. Like, let's not make the money. Yeah, so totally. <laughs> totally. Um, would you say there are any downsides to high yield savings? Uh, a question is why, you know, this particular attendee is asking why they haven't heard much about this as a popular option. Um, I think it's just one more account to open, right? Wouldn't you say? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it is a pain that I'm at a bank at Chase, but my savings account is somewhere else. So I have to think about it. And, um, but no, I don't, I, I mean, they're FDIC insured. It's a money market. So theoretically it could, it could go below 1% or 0%, but it right. has been. I've had it since 2001 when it was ING direct. And then it was wow. like, you know, capital one. So I've had it for a long time. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Okay. And I love that you said that, Galia, because I, uh, I know there's also a conversation right now around should folks be moving their money even between high yield savings accounts since uh, the Fed recently um, slashed interest rates. So I really appreciate that you've, you know, you're showing that you've had longevity with those accounts, even as rates have fluctuated, um, you've really stuck to your course. Well, and I, I loved your example of the two people because I, I do bank at Chase. I've been at Chase for a long time. And so, you know, I have a little savings account there just to keep my minimum. And it's like, what are they paying? Point zero 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 two five. And, you know, I was, when I was trying to show my daughter the power of savings, who's, she's now 16 and, you know, I opened an account for her and after six months, she's like, well, mom, it's not growing. And I was like, I know it's not growing. So, um, you know, we can do better. Totally. Mm -hmm. Um, so there are a lot of questions about uh, debt payoff and debt repayment. Um, one person is asking, what's the best way to pay down debt? The snowball or avalanche or um, how should they focus on interest rates and, and balances? Um, I'll just say for myself, uh, and, and I talk about this on my blog, but um, I was very intentional about consolidating my debt about a year ago um, into uh, using like 0% APR balance transfers to pretty much put a pause on the credit card or consumer debt that I had. Um, so by doing that, I focus more so on, um, on the balances that I wanted to eat at faster. I, I'm definitely a person that uh, focus more on the smaller balances growing over time. So the debt that I have left, I have about uh, 16 or so thousand dollars left to pay off this year. Um, those were my biggest balances that I had remaining, but I think it really depends. And golly, I'm curious what you think, but uh, from my perspective, it, it really depends on as you look at your balances and your interest rates, uh, being intentional about uh, a payoff plan that ensures that you are paying as little an interest as, as possible over the course of your repayment plan. Uh, would you, what would you say? Yeah, that's, it's a great question. There's no, like right or wrong answer because look at the end of the day you don't want to pay a lot of interest like that's just it's horrible to pay off that interest um but again like if you can pay off a big credit card that has a higher minimum and so i would say that you know i think in terms of like if you can consolidate to lower interest cards so you have essentially one payment to a low interest card that would be ideal and i know for me that i have found and I'm not a big fan of like these 0% cards that jump up because I find that, you know, again, it's like a lot of paperwork and you actually like lose. Um, so, you know, if you don't do it right away, it jumps up from like zero to like 14. It takes and, discipline for sure. Yeah. Right? And I, and I know yeah, a lot really of people, sneaky. right. Who actually, so I would say number one, I'm not a fan of that, but number two, like, you know, and I know on bankrate.com, you can find credit cards that have like a permanent low interest rate, like seven or 10%, which oh, wow. is still high, but that's lower than the 27 or 28% you might be paying. But yeah, I think if you can pay off the high interest rate cards as soon as possible, but at the same time pay off the ones with the bigger balances. So that way you're just, 
you know, getting ahead. And, you know, something you said, Sunia, that really struck a chord for me is I strongly, strongly feel that you should save and pay off your debt at the same time because mm. there are often we don't save because it just hasn't been a habit or hasn't been a priority. Mm -hmm. And then we don't get ahead. Mm -hmm. And our goal is for all of you to get ahead no matter where you are. So if you can even save, like if you have an extra $500 a month, save $25 a month and use the extra 475 to pay off your debt. But get in that, like make, move that muscle, make the savings yeah. a muscle. For sure, for sure. Um, a, a question related, Dana is asking if we could comment on why it's worthwhile to become debt free. Um, I, I'm really determined to pay off all of my debt this year uh, so that I can accelerate my, my wealth building uh, journey. Um, the more that I've learned about net worths and, and understanding the balance between what I own versus what I owe, um, I, I learned that my debt is really eating at my ability to create wealth. Um, and, and I feel really fortunate to be in a position where um, I have time on my hands to be able to invest um, like Galia was showing us. Uh, um, you know, I, I can start at 25 and see where my money can go over a 30 or 40 year investing horizon. So, uh, so for me, it, it just became uh, a challenge that I wanted to keep myself to, to really get out of debt and, and, and quickly relearn uh, better money habits that, that would serve me in the long run. Um, okay, so, I, so I'm just gonna jump to some of these questions. Does, yeah. why do we want a greater percentage in bonds at an older age? Well, I mean, to be honest, bonds are more stable. They're also called fixed income. So like bond funds are doing well now. They, you know, maybe they're up 1%, 2%. So if you're 70 years old, A, you're not earning any more income and you, you know, you have a much shorter period of time to watch your money grow, you know that bonds on the whole, like, so if you even bought like an individual bond, a treasury, well, treasury bonds are terrible, but corporate bonds at 2%, 3%, like, you know, it's not a lot, but at least I'm getting two or 3% and it's, nothing's guaranteed, but it's much more steady and reliable. Um, so I would do that one. Um, so I'm a divorced retiree with a secure, I hope, income and two young adult children whose income is based on the gig economy. Does it make sense for me to establish and contribute to a Roth IRA on their behalf? So I'm just going to say this, and I was quoted in the New York Times as this, first, before you take care of your children, make sure you're okay. It's such a cliche, but it's like the, you know, when you're on a plane and you pull down the oxygen mask. So yes, absolutely help your kids out. I'm, I have two kids, one's going to college in a year, two years. So I'm, I'm definitely about helping my children, but make sure you're okay. You don't want to be a burden on your children. You don't want to, you know, maybe you can't work anymore because you're older. So if you're okay with your retirement and you have enough saved, yes, help them out. But I will say the Roth IRA, you can only open with earned income. So they will have to have earned income. So maybe they were, um, whatever, their summer job. I mean, and it's not babysitting. Unfortunately, it has to be earned income that you've paying taxes on. Um, so hopefully that answered your question. Feel free to ask me more. Um, I do offer one-on-one -on -one consulting. I simply charge by the hour. So feel free to send me an email or check out my website, um, galiadowntoearthfinance.com. And I don't sell investments, don't manage money, just give you hourly advice. <laughs> um, Glad to hear a fan of Marcus. Um, yeah. So CDs, I love CDs, but it's all about interest rates. So you're locking in. So if you can get a CD that's paying more than 1.3% for a year, you know, that's okay. I don't know. I mean, it's pretty competitive. I don't know where I would find it on bank rate. I don't think I've seen, seen a CD for 2%. I had a CD at 2%, um, but I know that when they just relaunched it with the new rates, it was still only about one, one and a half percent. So why lock in your money at only 1.3 when you can leave it in a high yield savings account? Um, Chase money market account, I don't, what are they paying? I mean, the Chase money market account, I have Chase. Like if they're, I don't think the Chase money market account is paying 1.3. So if it is, let me know because I'm at Chase and I haven't seen it there for a long time. So is there a point where we should consider transferring or from managing our money ourselves to a financial advisor? I mean, that's a that's like about an hour question, but I would say for clients that are thinking about doing this, I you know, life is moderation. Like maybe start small and take ten thousand dollars if that's not a lot of money to you, or take a thousand or three thousand and say, let me just open a Vanguard mutual fund and see how that goes. And after three months, I'm like, oh, this isn't so bad. I can do it. It's not so hard. Then you can think about transferring it. Um, 
you know, I don't want to, there are some great advisors on there, so I don't want to take money away from advisors. And I do believe that all of us can do it on our own. Um, so, but you know, that can also be really scary. So I think like, if you want to do that, start by just trying it a little bit. Money is about moderation. Like I work with um, a lot of playwrights and one of them got the Rockefeller grant. So he'd made 30,000 a year and then all of a sudden he got an $800,000 payment, which is huge, especially when you're not making a lot of money. So the first thing we did is take out taxes <laughs> and then we helped him buy an apartment in Washington Heights. So he had a place to live. Um, but, the set, but the third thing we did is we didn't invest all that money at one time. If we said, let's invest it over six months or a year. You know. um, There's a great question around additional resources that we'd recommend for beginners to check out or where to start. Um, I know for me, it's, it's a great time to read some really great personal finance books if, if you're a big reader. Um, mm -hmm. I just finished The Simple Path to Wealth by J.L. Collins. And I know, Gala, you included a quote from Peter Lynch and um, J.L. Collins has a, a whole chapter on on why Vanguard is, is a great uh, is a, and a great option for your money. So I think if you're if you're on a debt free and wealth building journey, that's a book that I really like. And I'm also reading um, Quit Like a Millionaire uh, by Michelle Lung. So that's also a really great way, especially if you are um, about my age or class year. It, it's a great way to kind of think more proactively about what's on our horizons. Yeah. Now, and I'll just add first of all, there's so many out there, but um, just yeah. as as a website that I love, to be honest, the New York Times, Ron Lieber, Tara Seale Bernard are my two favorite. They're columnists and they, um, and then there's a, I don't remember the person who authors it, but Wealth Matters. So Ron Lieber and Tara Seale Bernard, they're, they write for the middle class. Um, they write for everything from paying off debt to college. Ron is very into children right now. So he's, he's actually written books on money and kids and allowance and such. But it's like probably the one thing I still read every week. It's your money. And they've done a fantastic job with personal finance and COVID and resources. So I would strongly suggest if you're going to read something online, that's a great. Um, and then as books go, I my probably my favorite book is by Beth Koblener with a K. Um, and it's called Personal, it's called Get a Financial Life. And it's personal finance in your 20s, 30s. But disregard the 20s and 30s. It's for everybody. So she's an article in home finance, an article in life insurance, an article in budgeting. And she's so great. She actually did something on Sesame Street with Elmo. She's I'm just, so she wrote this book probably 15 years ago, and then she just updated it recently in the last year or two with apps and resources. So, and I will say, I go back to like Jean Chatsky and Susie Orman's early books that you can buy, you know, used on Amazon for a few pennies. Um, they're great books, the seven steps books. I still recommend those. I could go on on more books, but those are two of my great, my favorites. <laughs> so I think there's, a, there's also a question around in investments, if, uh, if there are other ways to diversify our investments, such as property or businesses. Yeah, so, you know, at the end of the day, I'm about moderation. So I think that, you know, I do, I have, I own my house, plus I have an investment property. Um, you know, do I invest in a business? Not personally, but I would never put 100% of my savings, whether it's retirement into just an investment, um, such as a property or just as a business. So I think that as long as you've got some money in a retirement savings, you've got some money that you own a home and you've got equity in a home that the equity is higher than your mortgage. You've got life insurance for children, term life insurance. Then you think about how can I also invest in property or business? So again, I'm, I absolutely am a fan of them, but it's all about diversification. And, you know, I'm probably a little more conservative. I was a bond analyst. So I do think that you want to make sure that you're safe and secure and you don't have the debt um, before you do those things. But yeah, I think they're fantastic tools as long as you have some of the other boxes checked. Okay, great. Um, public school teacher. Let's see here. Um, and then I'll answer this one question and then there's a question for Sania. Um, I'm a New York City public school teacher. My husband has no retirement savings, but saving for retirement in the TBA. The interest is higher than the other suggestions. Is there another way for me to diversify? Um, my TBA is in fixed and I'm in my late 50s. Um, so the first thing I would say is that, um, so your husband has no retirement savings. So he can still open one up if he has earned income. So he can still, I don't know how, what his job situation is. If he works for someone contributing to that plan or doing a Roth IRA if your income 
allows for it or if he works for himself. So I definitely encourage him to do something for his own if he has earned income, if he's not working. Um, to, you know, I always say to teachers, if you can make it until, <laughs> until you're vested and do it because the teacher's retirement plans are fantastic. So you just have to make it for being a teacher for 20, 30 years, which is not easy as, as I have children in the public school system. So I'm really in admiration of teachers, especially now during COVID. Um, but the TDA is fantastic. So yes, the, and I don't know if you're just in the fixed 100%. If you're just in the fixed, then you're probably earning two to 4%, which is great, but you wanna have a little bit of equity in there. Um, you don't want it to be 100% in the fixed. You wanna have just even like 10, 20% of the equity, especially in your 50s and you're gonna get a pension. And then lastly with the TDA is I would suggest that doing a calculator, whether it's on Fidelity or on their site to say, okay, with this TDA or this pension, what is that gonna pay me at age 65? Is that gonna pay me 50,000 a year, 75,000 a year? So you can really budget and forecast that that will be enough. I think, Sunia, this next question is for you. Oh yeah, what is what is the ideal budget ratio you'd recommend? So there's a, a lot of, uh, you, you've probably seen the budget ratio of 50% towards your needs, 30% toward 30 and 20% left towards your wants and um, and your savings. I obviously do not live by that budget ratio. Um, so I think as you think about a plan that might work for you and your financial pictures, really think about what do you want to do with your money? I know for me, I want to be aggressive about paying down debt. So I have tried my best to shrink my needs. I'm currently in my apartment that I share with two other roommates. Um, I've been living here since I, I graduated from, from graduate school. Um, so that's a way that I lower my housing expenses so that I can put the money that I might be spending on rent towards uh, getting out of debt and also being able to save for emergencies and, and for retirement. Um, so I think the, the budget ratio that probably works best for you um, and, and how you can think about it is, is first understanding like what is your income coming in? Um, always starting there. If, if you are fortunate enough to still have earned income, think about that. Think about what are your absolute necessary expenses that you need to survive. Um, we call it like a bare bones budget. Um, and, and then understand, do you have a surplus? Do you have money left over? Um, or if you don't have money left over, are there ways that you can either adjust your expenses? Can you negotiate some of those expenses to lower amounts every month? Like, like I, I mentioned in the presentation, um, or even supplement your income, uh, by monetizing your skills or, 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 um, or also picking up other income. So, um, so that would be my recommendation. Gali, I don't know if you have anything to add. No, you know, I think. I actually don't like to be tied to a ratio because I would stop and say that like the way I do a budget and there's so many ways and I, I learned that one yes. size does not fit all. So I thought like I was looking at yours and I was like, Oh my God, I've never seen it that way. I love it. I love <laughs> it. It's just really, but you know, for me, I'm going to go back to savings. Like I just want to make sure you're saving enough. So really like I will give you a weekly amount to live on that allows you to save for emergencies and retirement and travel. Those are sort of my big three buckets. And you, I love that you have the buckets. So I think as long as you can give yourself a weekly amount to live on for variable expenses, um, that lets you save the way you want to save and take care of yourself and sleep at night, then that's the budget. So in terms of a ratio. And I'd say the first step is just start saving an amount and then you can increase it version two when you've already started saving like get do the hard work which is just start saving and putting that money away that's great um but i i thought what sunia did is just i was like oh i'm gonna, I'm gonna follow that um yeah. <laughs> i didn't come up with it so you could totally steal it <laughs> no 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 um gosh we have so many great questions here so annuities overall i'm not a fan of annuities for a few reasons so there's variable annuities and fixed annuities I will say variable annuities cost on average about 3% a year. And again, I'm just cheap. I'm a budget gal. Like when it comes, I don't want you to spend 3% a year um, when you can invest your money. So there are very few reasons why variable annuities are good. And if you really think variable annuities are good for you, again, Fidelity and Vanguard sells them for 0.25%. But most of the time, variable annuities are sold through insurance. Um, and again, it's just 3% a year, and that's just a lot of money. So I just don't want to pay that. A fixed annuity, though, is different, and I really do like fixed annuities. However, if you're buying a so a fixed annuity is essentially like you, there's lots of different ones, but a fixed annuity is actually we're just getting a question. So, um, 
you know, basically we are going to stay on for another 10 minutes just to let people know. So feel free to ask your questions, Cindy and I and the rest of the alumni. Um, so a fixed annuity is you lock in, you give essentially the insurance company $100,000, for example, and they agree to pay you a monthly amount based on the interest rate that you're locking it in. So it actually is a great, great tool for people that are close to retirement. The problem is today you're locking in a fixed annuity at current interest rates, which are incredibly low. I mean, the treasury rate, the 10 year treasury rate is under 1%. So I do love fixed annuities and I love it for my clients that are retiring, but it's just interest rates are too low right now that I wouldn't buy it in because you're locking in a fixed interest rate for the rest of your life, which is an essentially in a deflationary environment. Um, so hopefully that answered your question. <laughs> Um, and then uh, consolidate, transfer your IRA. So say you have Roth IRAs at various places. Absolutely, you can consolidate those to one place. Say you have old 401ks from different jobs. You can either transfer them to your current 401k or you can roll them over to one place to a, what's called a rollover IRA. So that's what I mean by consolidate. Because the idea is that like I get one statement. It has my rollover IRAs, which is all my old 401ks from when I worked at Bear Stearns and Nomura. Then I, in the same statement has my SEP IRA, which is my current retirement plan because I work for myself. Then I have a Roth IRA that I open. And then I have just my regular individual investments, taxable investments. Um, Capital One 360. Um, there, you know, capital, those, to be honest, I'm not finding high yield accounts more than 1.3% right now. I wish there were, but it's really based on current treasuries. So 1.3 is the highest I've seen. Um, trying to see if we, in, are we missing any questions here? I think we answered them all. Okay, great. If you have any more, um, and I know we both give a lot of information in like 45 minutes, um, but the good news is the PDFs will be available to you. Um, so there's lots of resources there and you know feel free to email us or we'll stay on for five more minutes if anybody has any more questions great best of luck and stay safe and follow Sunia's resources just um you know i think that um I'm, thank you yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. thanks so, so much thank Thank you this for is, this that. is great. I'm really, I'm really happy we could uh, share these resources with folks. Yeah, no, I'm, I took a, I took a screenshot and I'm going to just literally, I'm going to text them to my daughters and follow through on them. So thank you. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much, Kalia and Sinia. This was a wonderful presentation. I will show you, I am a little old school, so <laughs> I have a notebook <laughs> and I took a lot of notes. I have two pages of notes. Oh, yes. I'm old school also. <laughs> yes. So between the computer, I'm typing on MS Word. I see you, Cindy. I'm typing on MS Word and writing in my notebook. It's, it's, it was very helpful and perfect timing. Uh, I feel like every year we should review our finances because we are at different stages of life. And there's constant changes that sometimes, of course, we don't know when it will happen. So this is definitely really good, very good life lessons. And yes, we will reiterate that um, there will be a link for today's presentation. It was recorded. Um, you may also email alumni relations at barnard.edu. Again, that is alumni relations at barnard.edu. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. Again, my name is Free Mondesir, class 2003. Thank you so much, and I um, hope you continue to enjoy the rest of the reunion. Thank you. <laughs>